I'm not next to you. Was I just My father was a king, and the son of kings. He was short, as most of us were, and, and built like a bull, all shoulders. He married my mother when she was fourteen, and sworn by the priestess to be fruitful. It was a good match. She was an only child, and her father's fortune would go to her husband. He did not find out until the wedding that she was simple. Her father had been scrupulous about keeping her veil until the ceremony, and my father had humoured him. If she was ugly, there were always slave girls and serving boys. When at last they pulled off the veil, 
They say my mother smiled. Well, that is how they knew she was quite stupid. Brides did not smile. When I was a boy, when I was born, in fact, he plucked me from her arms and, and handed me to a nurse. In, in pity, the midwife gave my mother a pillow to hold instead of me. My mother hugged it. She did not seem to notice a change had been made. Quickly, I became a disappointment. Small, slight. I was not fast. I was not strong. I, I could not sing. The best that could be, could be said of me was that I was not sickly. But the colds and cramps that seized my peers left me untouched. This only made my father suspicious. Was I a, a changeling, inhuman? He scowled at me, watching. My hand shook, trembling under his gaze. And then there was my mother, dribbling wine on herself. I am five when it is my father's turn to host the games. Men gather from as far as Thessaly and Sparta, and our storehouses grow rich with their gold. I remember the runners best, nut brown bodies slicked with oil, stretching on the track beneath the sun. The youngest boys are running first, and they wait, shuffling their feet in the sand for the nod from the priest. My eye catches on a light head among dozens of dark, tousled crowns, hair lit like honey in the sun, and within it, a glimpse of gold. The circlets of a prince. He is shorter than the others and still plump with childhood in a way that they are not. His hair is long and tied back with leather. It burns against the dark, bare skin of his back. His face, when he turns, is as serious as a man's. When the priest strikes the ground, he slips past the thickened bodies of the other boys. He moves easily, his heels flashing pink as licking tongues. He wins. I stare as my father lifts the garland and crowns him. The leaves seem almost black against the brightness of his hair. His father, Peleus, comes to claim him, smiling and proud. Peleus' kingdom is smaller than ours, but his wife is rumored to be a goddess, and his people love him. My own father watches with envy. His wife is stupid, and his son too slow to race even in the youngest group. He turns to me. That is what a son should be. I see the boy toss the garland in the air and catch it again. He is laughing, and his face is bright with victory. Beyond this, I remember a little more than scattered images from my life then. My father, frowning at his throne. A cunning toy horse I loved. My mother on the beach, her eyes turned towards the Aegean. In this last memory, I am Keeping stones for her, plink, plink, plink across the skin of the sea. She seems to like the way the ripples look, dispersing back to glass. Or perhaps it is the sea itself she likes. At her temple, a starburst of white gleams like bone, a scar from her time of father. Her father hit her with the hilt of a sword. Her toes poke up in the sand where she has buried them, and I am careful not to disturb them when I search for rocks. Choose one and, and fling it out. You're glad to be good at this. It is the only memory I have of my mother, and so golden that I am almost sure I have made it up. After all, it was unlikely for my father to have allowed us to be alone together, his simple son and simpler wife. And where are we? I do not recognize the beach, the view of coastline. So much has passed since then. At nine years old, I was summoned to the king. King Tyndarus' daughter, Helen, is finally ready for marriage. We would do well to have her in our family. Family, you will go forth and put yourself forth as a suitor. We left the next morning, our packs heavy with gifts and food for the journey. Soldiers escorted us in their finest armor. I I don't remember much of the trip. It was overland through countryside that left no impression.
Paris, the Citadel. The stables were full of horses and mules, busy with servants. Finally, a day came when we were called forward to council, seated on benches that were draped with cowhide. The servants faded backwards to the shadows. My father's fingers dug into my collar, warning me not to fidget. There was violence in that room, with so many princes and heroes and kings competing for a single prize, Helen. But we knew how to ape civilization. One by one, they introduced themselves, these young men showing off shining hair and neat waists and expensively dyed clothing. Many were the sons or grandsons of gods, all had a song or two or more written of their deeds. Tyndarius greeted each in turn, accepted their gifts in a pile in the center of the room, and invited each to speak and present his suit. Man after man, and the name began to blur in my head. My attention wandered to the dais, where I noticed for the first time three veiled women sitting at Tyndarius' side. I stared with white cloth over their faces, as if I might be able to catch some glimpse of the woman behind them. My father wanted one of them to my wife. Three sets of hands, pretty along with the bracelets lay quietly in their laps. One of the women was taller than the other two. I thought I saw it. A straight, dark curl peeped from beneath the bottom of her veil. Helen is light haired, I remembered. So that one was not Helen. I had ceased to listen to the kids. At first, my father spoke for me, but Tyndarius did not approve. If your son is to be a suitor, as you say, let him present himself. Even I knew it was my turn to speak. I am Patroclus, son of Menoetius. I am here as a suitor for Helen, my father is a king, and this other things. I had no more to say. <laughs> Excuse me, King Tyndarius. I looked up at the new voice. A man who had not spoken yet. He was the last in line, sitting at ease on the bench, his curling hair gleaming in the light of the fire. He had a jagged scar on one leg, a seam that stitched his dark brown flesh from heel to knee, wrapping around the muscles of his calf and burying itself in the shadow beneath his tunic. It looked like it had been a knife, I thought, or something like it, ripping upwards and leaving behind feathered edges, whose softness belied the violence that must have caused it. Son of Laertes, what does a disinterested observer have to say to these proceedings? I'd like to know how you're going to keep the losers from declaring war on you, or on Helen's lucky new husband. I see half a dozen men here ready to leap at each other's throats. You seem amused. I find the folly of men amusing. The son of Laertes scorns us. Son of Telamon, never. Then what, Odysseus? Speak your mind for once. This was a dangerous gamble, despite the treasure and renown that you've won. Each of these men is worthy and knows it. They will not be so easily put off. All of this you have said to me already. True, but now I offer a solution. I have brought no gift. You do not seek to woo Helen. I'm a king of rocks and goats. In return for my solution, I seek from you the prize that I've already named. Give me your solution and you shall have it. A slight movement from the dais. One woman's hand twitched against her companion's dress. And here it is. I believe we should let Helen choose. That way no one may fault you. But she must choose now at this very moment. So it cannot be said she took counsel or instruction from you. And before she chooses, every man here must swear an oath to uphold Helen's choice and to defend her husband from all who would take her from him. I felt the unrest in the room. An oath? And over such an unconventional matter as a woman choosing her husband, the men were very suspicious. Very well. Helen, do you accept this proposal? I do. It was all she said. But I felt the shiver go through the men around me. Even as a child, I felt it, and I marveled at the power of this woman who, though veiled, could electrify a room. Her skin we suddenly remembered it was rumored to be gilded, her eyes dark and shining as the slick obsidian we traded our olives for. At that moment, she was worth all the prizes in the center of the hall and more. She was worth our lives. So be it. All those who wish to swear will do so now. I heard muttering, a few half-angry voices, but no man left. Helen's voice and the veil, gently fluttering with her breath, held us all captive. A swiftly summoned priest led a white girl to the altar. Here inside, it's a more propitious choice than the whole whose throat might splash unwholesomely upon the stone floor. The appetite easily in the man makes its dark bump inside the fire. The whole hissed 
loud at the sign of Greek. You will be first. One by one, the priests summon us to the hub, marking our wrists with blood and ash, binding us chains. I chanted the words of the oath back to my arm lifted for all to see. When the last man turned to his place, Tyndarius spoke. Choose now, my daughter. Menelaus. She spoke without hesitation, startling us all. We had expected suspense, indecision. So be it. I am glad to welcome a second son of Atreus to my family. He may have my Helen, just as his worthy brother once claimed my Clytemnestra. What about the third girl? Your niece. Can I have her? You're too late. She's promised to me. My father would never mention the trip again. At once home, the events twisted strangely in my memory. The blood and the oath, the room full of kings, they seemed distant and pale, like, like something a bard had spun rather than something I had lived. And had I really knelt there before them? And, and what of the oath I had sworn? It seemed absurd even to think of it, foolish and improbable as a dream is by dinner. Life 
scrambling to keep his kingdom. And he would not risk losing it over such a son as me, when heirs and the wombs that they were born from were so easy to come by. So, he agreed. I would be exiled and fostered in another man's kingdom. In exchange for my weight in gold, they would bring me to manhood. I would have no parents, no family name, no inheritance. In our day, death was preferable. But my father was a practical man. My weight in gold was less than the expense of the lavish funeral my death would have demanded. This was how I came to be ten and an orphan. This was how I came to fear. Since I'd seen him, he had outgrown his babyish roundness. 
I gaped at the cold chalk of his beauty, deep green eyes, features fine as girls. It struck for me a sudden spring dislike. I had not changed so much, nor so well. He yawned, his eyes heavy lidded. What's your name? His kingdom was a half, a quarter, an eighth the size of my father's, and I had killed a boy and been exiled, and still he did not know me. What's your name? Patroclus. My name is Achilles. Welcome to Thea. I had been raised in the court and knew dismissal when I heard it. I discovered that afternoon that I was not the only foster child of Peleus. The modest king turned out to be rich in cast off sons. He had once been a runaway himself, it was rumored, and had a reputation for charity towards exiles. My bed was a power pallet in a long barrack style room filled with other boys tussling and lounging. The servant showed me where my things had been put. A few boys lifted their heads, stared. I'm sure one of them spoke to me, asked my name. I'm sure I gave it. They returned to their games. No one had warned. I walked stiff legged to my pallet and waited for dinner. <clears throat> we were summoned to eat at dusk by a bell. Bronze struck from deep in the palace's turnings. The boys dropped their games and tumbled out into the hallway. The complex was built like a rabbit warren, full of twisting corridors and sudden inner rooms. I nearly tripped over the heels of the boy in front of me, fearful of being left behind and lost. The room for meals was a long hall at the front of the palace, its windows opening onto Mount Otis's foothills. It was large enough to feed all of us many times over. Peleus was a king who liked to host and entertain. We sat on his own wood benches and tables that had been, been scratched from years of battering plates. The food was simple but plentiful, salted fish and thick bread served with herb cheese. There was no flesh here of goats or bulls. That was only for royalty or festival days. <coughs> Across the room, I caught the flash of black, bright hair in that light. Achilles. He sat with a group of boys whose mouths were wide with laughter at something he'd said or done. That is what a prince should be. After supper, we were allowed to do as we liked. Some boys were gathering in the corner for a game. Do you want to play? Play? Dice. No. All right. He shrugged and was gone. That night, I dreamed of the dead boy. His skull cracked like an egg against the ground. He, he has followed me. And the blood spreads, dark as spilled wine. His eyes open and his mouth begins to move. I, I, I clap my hands over my ears. The voices of the dead were said to make, have the power to make the living mad. I, I must not hear him speak. I woke in terror, hoping I had not screamed aloud. Pinpricks of stars outside of my window were the only light. There was no moon I could see. My breathing was harsh and silent, and the marsh reed ticking of the mattress crackled softly beneath me, rubbing its thin fingers against my back. The presence of the other boys did not comfort me. How are dead comfort their vengeance regardless of witnesses? My limbs were heavy and dull. The other boys surged around me, dressing for breakfast, eager for the day. Word had spread quickly of my strangeness, and the younger boy did not approach me again with dice or anything else. At breakfast, my fingers pushed bread between my lips, and my throat swallowed. Milk was poured for me. I drank it. Afterwards, we were led to the dusty side of the practice yard for training in spear and sword. Here is where I learned the full truth of Peleus' kindness. Well trained and indebted, we would one day make him a fine army. Meals in the vaulted dining hall were really my only relief. 
There the walls did not seem to press in on me so much, and the dust from the courtyard did not fog in my throat. The buzz of constant voices eased as mouths were stuffed full. I could sit with my food alone and breathe again. It was also the only time I saw Achilles. His days were separate, princely, filled with duties we had no part of, but he took each meal with us, circulating among the tables. In the huge hall, his beauty shone like a flame, vital and bright, drawing my eye against my will. His mouth was a plump bow, his nose an aristocratic arrow. When he was seated, his limbs did not skew as mine did, but arranged themselves with perfect grace as if for a sculptor. He did not preen or pout as other handsome children did. Indeed, he seemed utterly unaware of his effect on the boys around him. Though how he was, I could not imagine. They crowded him like dogs in their eagerness, tongues lolling. I watched all of this from my place at the corner table. Bread crumpled in my fist. The keen edge of my envy was like flint, a spark away from fire. One of these days, he sat closer to me than usual, a table distant. His dusty feet scuffed against the flagstones as he ate. They were not cracked and calloused as mine were, but pink and sweetly brown beneath the dirt. Prince, I sneered inside my head. He turned as if he had heard me. For a second our gaze held, and I felt a shock run through me. I, I jerked my eyes away and busied myself with, with my breath. When at last I ventured to lock up again, he turned back to his table and was speaking to the other boys. And after that, I was crafty with my observation. Kept my head down and my eyes ready to leap away. But he was craftier still. At least once a dinner, he would turn and catch me before I could feign indifference. Those seconds, half seconds, were the only time of my day that I felt anything at all. The sudden swoop of my stomach, the coursing anger, I was like a, a fish eyeing the hook. In the fourth week of my exile, I walked into the dining hall to find him at the table where I always sat. My table, as I had come to think of it, and now because of him the benches were full of jostling boys. And I froze, all between flight and fury. Anger won. This was mine. You would not push me from it, no matter how many boys you brought. At the last empty space, my shoulders tensed as if for a fight. Across the table, the boys postured and prattled about a spear and a bird that had died on the beach and the spring races. I did not hear them. His presence was like a stone in my shoe, impossible to ignore. His skin was the color of just pressed olive oil and smooth as polished wood, without the scads and blemishes that covered the rest of us. Dinner finished and the plates were cleared. A harvest moon, full and orange, hung in the dust beyond the dining room's windows. Yet, Achilles lingered. Absently, he pushed the hair from his eyes. It had grown longer over the weeks since I'd been here. He reached for a bowl on the table that held figs and gathered several in his hands. With a toss of his wrist, he flicked the figs into the air, one, two, three, juggling them so lightly that their delicate skin did not bruise. He had a fourth, then a fifth, the boys wooded and glass. More, 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 more. more, more. The fruits blew, colors blurring so fast they seemed not to touch his hands, to tumble of their own accord. Juggling was a trick of low mummers and beggars, but that was now it's something else. A living pattern on the air, so beautiful, even I could not pretend to sing wow. His gaze, which had been following the circling fruit, flickered to mine. I did not have time to look away before he said softly, oh, come on, pick him up. Pick him up. Okay. a fig left from the pattern, and it it fell into the cup of my palm, soft and slightly warm. Wow. I was aware of the boys cheering. <laughs> one by one, Achilles caught the remaining fruits and turned them to the table with the performer's flourish. Except for the last, which he ate, the dark flesh parting to pink seeds under his teeth. The fruits perfectly ripe, the juice brimming. Without thinking, I brought the one he had thrown me to my lips. Its burst of grainy sweetness filled my mouth. The skin was downy on my tongue. I had loved figs once. He stood and the boys chorused their farewells. I thought he might look back at it again, but he only turned and vanished to his room on the other side of the palace.
next day, Peleus returned to the palace, and I was brought before him in his throne room, smoky and sharp from the Hewwood fire. Duly, I knelt, saluted him, and received his famously charitable smile. He seemed old to me, <laughs> bent over, but he was no more than fifty, my father's age. He did not look like a man who could have conquered a goddess or produced such a child as Achilles. You're here because you killed a boy. You understand this? This was the cruelty of adults. Do you understand this? Yes. I could have told him more. Of the dreams that left me bleary and bloodshot, almost screams that scraped down my throat as I swallowed them down, the way the stars turned and turned through the night above my unsleeping eyes. You're welcome here. You may still make a good man. He meant discomfort. Later that day, perhaps from him, perhaps from a listening servant, the boys learned at last the reason for my exile. I should have expected it. I had heard them gossip of others often enough. Rumor was the only coin the boys had to trade in. Still, it took me by surprise to see the sudden change in them, the, the fear and fascination blooming in their faces as I passed. Now even the boldest of them would whisper a prayer if he brushed against me. Bad luck could be caught. And the Erinets, our hissing spirits of vengeance, were not always particular. The boys watched from a safe distance, enthralled. Will they drink his blood, do you think? Their whispers choked me, turned the food in my mouth to ash. I, I pushed away my, my plate and sought out corners and spare halls where I might sit undisturbed except for the occasional passing servant. My narrow world narrowed further to the cracks in the floor, the, the holes in the stone walls. They rasped softly as I traced them with my fingertip. I heard you were here. A clear voice, like ice melted streams. My head jerked up. I was in the storeroom, my knees against my chest, wedged between jars of thick pressed olive oil. I'd been dreaming myself a fish, silvered by the sea, at the sun by, as it leapt from the sea. The waves dissolved, became amphorae and grain sacks again. It was Achilles standing over me. His face was serious, the green of his eyes steady as he regarded me. I prickled with guilt. I was not supposed to be here, and I knew it. I have been looking for you. You have not been going to morning drills. How do you know? You aren't there. The master noticed and spoke to my father. And he said you. No! I came on my own. I overheard them speaking and came to see if you were ill. My father is considering punishment. We knew what this meant. Punishment was corporal and usually public. A prince would never be whipped, but I was no longer a prince. You are not ill. No. But now will not serve as your excuse. What? Your excuse for where you have been. So you will not be punished, what will you say? Well, I don't know. You must say something. You are the prince. So? So speak to your father and say I was with you. He will excuse it. Do you not like to lie? It was the sort of innocence other boys taunted out of you. Even if you felt it, you did not say it. Well, then take me with you to your lessons, so it won't be a lie. He was utterly still, the type of quiet I thought could not belong to humans, a stilling of everything but breath and pulse, like a deer, listening for the hunter's foot. I found myself holding my breath. Then something shifted in his face, a decision. Come. Well, to my liar lesson. So as you say, you will not be alive. You will speak with my father after. Well, now? Yes. Why not? Why not? When I stood to follow him, my limbs ached from so long seated on cold stone. My chest trilled with something I could not quite name. Escape and danger and hope, all at once. <laughs> Halls and came at length to a small room, holding only a large chest and stools for sitting. Achilles gestured to one, and I went to it, leather pulled taut over a spare wooden frame. 
a musician's chair. I'd seen them only when the bards came, infrequently, play at my father's fireside. Achilles opened the chest and pulled out an instrument. He settled it on his knees. The wood was carved and golden and trimmed with careful keeping. It was my mother's lyre, the one my father had sent as part of my price. Achilles plucked a string. The note rose, warm and resonant, sweetly pure. My mother had always pulled her chair close to the bards when they came. So close my father would scowl and the servants would whisper. I remembered suddenly the dark gleam of her eyes in the firelight as she washed the bard's hands. The look on her face was like thirst. That is my mother's lyre, I almost said. The words were in my throat and behind them others crowded close. That is my lyre. But I did not speak. What would he say to such a statement? The lyre was his now. It is beautiful. My father gave it to me. You can hold it if you like. No. I will not cry in front of him. He started to say something, but at that moment the teacher entered, a man of indeterminate middle age. His <laughs> calloused hands were in position. Who is this? This is Patroclus. He does not play, but he will learn. Not on that instrument. Yes, on this instrument, if he likes. Very well. His fingers touch the strings, and all my thoughts are displaced. The sound was pure and sweet as water, bright as lemons. It was like no music I had ever heard before. It, it had warmth, as a fire does, a texture and weight like polished ivory, it buoyed and, and soothed at once. A few hairs slipped forward to hang on his eyes as he played. They were fine as live strings themselves and shown. Now you. I could not play now. Not ever if I could listen to him instead. You keep playing. The music continued. This time he sang also, weaving his own accompaniment with a clear, rich treble. His head fell back a little, exposing his throat to supple and fallen skin soft. A small smile lifted the left corner of his mouth. Without meaning to, I found myself leaning forward. When at last he ceased, my chest felt strangely hollow. I watched him rise to replace the lyre, close the trunk. He bid farewell to the teacher, who turned and left. It took me a long moment before I came back to myself to, to notice he was waiting for me. Who was my father? I did not quite trust myself to speak, so I, I nodded and followed him out of the room and up the twisting hallway to the king. <laughs> Stain on him. He will add no luster to your reputation. I do not need him to. 
yet other boys will be envious that you've chosen such a one. But what will you tell them? I will tell them nothing. It is not for them to say what I will do. Very well. Both of you, get up. I pronounce my sentence. Uh, Achilles, you will give your apologies to Amphidamus, and uh, Patroclus will give his as well. That's all. I'll see you at dinner. Well, where are you going? Drills. Alone? Yes. No one sees me fight. Well, why? Because of the prophecy. What prophecy? That I will be the greatest warrior of our generation. It sounded like something a young child would claim and make believe, but he said it as simply as if you were giving his name. The question I wanted to ask was, and are you the best? Instead, I studied out. Well, when was the prophecy given? When I was born, just before. Eletheia came and told it to my mother. Eletheia, goddess of childbirth, rumored to preside in person over the birth of half gods, those whose nativities were too important to be left to chance. I had forgotten. His mother is a goddess. Is this known? Some know of it, and some do not. And that is why I go alone. Well, then I will see you at dinner.
again. <laughs> well, you're good at that at least. Catch. A ball came back to me, just like the fig at dinner. My part took no great skill, but I enjoyed it anyways. We found ourselves smiling at the satisfaction of each smooth catch and throw. After some time, he stopped, yawned. I was surprised to see the moon high outside the window. I had not noticed the minutes passing. I sat on the pallet and watched as he busied himself with the task of bed, watching his face with water from a wide mouth ear, and tying a bit of leather that bound his hair. Silence brought my uneasiness back. Why was I here? Good night. Good night. The words felt strange in my mouth like another language. Time passed. In the moonlight, I could just make out the shape of his face, sculpted perfect across the room. His lips were parted slightly, and arms fell carelessly above his head. He looked different in sleep, beautiful but cold as moonlight. I found myself wishing he would wake so that I might watch the light return. The next morning, after breakfast, I went back to the boys' room, expecting to find my things returned. They were not. And I saw that my bed had been stripped of his linens. I checked again after lunch, <laughs> and after spear practice, and then again before bed. But my old place remained empty and unmade. So, still, warily, I made my way to his room, half expecting a servant to stop me, but None did. In the doorway of his room, I, I hesitated. He was within, lounging as I had seen him that first day before, one leg dangling. Hello. If he had shown any hesitation or surprise, I would have left, gone back, and slept on the bare weeds rather than stay here. But he did not. There was only his easy tone and a sharp attention in his eyes. Hello. <laughs> I went to take my place on across the room. Slowly, I grew used to it. I no longer started when he spoke, no longer waited for a view. I, I stopped expecting to be sent away. After dinner, my feet took me to his room out of habit, and I thought the pallet where I lay as mine. At night, I still dreamed of the dead boy. But when I woke, sweaty and terror-stricken, the moon would be bright on the water outside. I could hear the lick of the waves on the, on, the, on the shore. In the dim light, I saw his easy breathing, the drowsy tangle of his limbs. In spite of myself, my pulse slowed. There was a vividness to him, even at rest, that made death and spirit seem foolish. After a time, I found I could sleep again. Time after that, the dreams lessened, and dropped away. I learned that he was not so dignified as he looked. Beneath his poise and stillness there was another face, full of mischief and fastened like a gem catching the light. He liked to play games against his own skill, catching things with his eyes closed, setting himself impossible leaps over tables and chairs. But when he smiled, the skin at the corner of his eyes crinkled like a leaf held to flame. He was like a flame himself. He glittered drew eyes. There was a glamour to him, even on waking, with his hair towelled and his face still muddled with sleep. Up close, his feet looked almost unearthly, perfectly formed pads of the toes, the tendons that flickered like lyre strings. The heels were cast white over pink from going everywhere barefoot. His father made them, made him rub them with oils that smelled of pomegranate and sandalwood. He began to tell me stories of the day after we drifted after we drifted off to sleep. At first, I only listened. But after a time, my tongue loosened. I, I began to tell my own stories, first of the palace and later small bits from before. The skipping stones, the wooden horse I had played with, the lyre from my mother's dowry. We're glad you brought us with you. Soon, our conversations spilled out of the night's confinement. I surprised myself with, with how much there was to say about everything, the beach and dinner and one boy or another. <coughs> I stopped.
stopped watching for ridicule. The scorpion's tail hidden in his words. He said what he meant, and he was puzzled if you did not. For some people might have mistaken this for simplicity, but is it not sort of genius to cut the voice of the heart? One afternoon, as I went to leave him to his private drills, he said, Why don't you, why don't you come with me? His voice was a little strained. If I had not thought it impossible, I might have said he was nervous. The air, which had grown comfortable between us, felt suddenly tough. All right. It was a quiet hours of late afternoon. The palace left out the heat and left us alone. We took the longest way through the olive grove's twisting path to the house where the arms were kept. I stood in the doorway as he selected his practice weapons, a spear and a sword, slightly blunted at the tip. I reached for my own, then hesitated. Should I? No. I do not fight with others. Never? Never. Well, then how do you know that the prophecy is true? I guess I don't. The divine blood flows differently in each god or child. Orpheus's voice made the trees weep. Heracles could kill a man by clapping him on the back. Achilles' miracle was his speed. His spear, as it began the first pass, moved faster than my eye could follow. It whirled, flashing forward, reversed, the flash behind. The shaft seemed to flow in his hands. The dark gray point flickered like a snake's tongue. His feet beat the ground like a dancer, never still. I could not move watching. I almost did not breathe. His face was calm and blank, not tense with effort. His movements were so precise, I could almost see the men he fought, 10, 20 of them advancing on all sides. He leapt, skyping his spear, even as his other hand snatched the sword from its sheath. He swung out with them both, moving like liquid, like a fish through the waves. He stopped suddenly. I could hear his breaths, only a little louder than usual in the still afternoon air. My father. A little. No one else. <coughs> no one. Fight me. No, of course not. Fight me. I felt in a trance. He had been trained a little by his father. The rest was what? The divine? This was more of the gods than I had seen in my life. He made it look beautiful, this sweating, hacking art of ours. I understood why his father did not let him fight in front of the others. How could any ordinary man take pride in his own skill when there is this in the world? Do not want to. I dare you. You don't have any weapons. I'll get them. No, I won't. Do not ask me again. Well, I will ask you again. You cannot forbid me. I would have this thing. He would give it to me. His face twisted, and almost I thought I saw anger. This pleased me. I would go to him if nothing else. He would fight me then. My nerves sang with the danger of it, but, but instead he walked away. His, his weapons abandoned in the dirt. Come back! Come back! Are you afraid? No. I am not afraid. As you should be. <laughs> <laughs> I meant it as a joke. <laughs> An easing, but it did not sound that way in the still air that hung between us. The back stared at me, unmoving, unmovable. I will make him look at me. <clears throat> Let me go! No. I've never seen anyone fight the way you do. You haven't seen much yet. You know what I mean. Maybe. What do you mean? I mean that... There was no one like you. So? Something in the way he said it drained the last of my anger from me. I had minded once. But who was I now to begrudge such a thing? As if he had heard me, he smiled, and his face was like the sun. Our friendship came all at once after that, like spring floods from the mountains. Before, the boys and I had imagined that his days were filled with princely instruction, statecraft, and spear, but I had long since learned the truth. Other than his lyre lessons and his drills, he had no instruction. One day, 
We might go swimming. Another, we might climb trees. We, we made up games for ourselves of racing and tumbling. We would lie on the warm sand and say, guess what I'm thinking about? The, the, the falcon we had seen from our window. The, the boy with the crooked front tooth. Dinner. And as we swam or played or talked, a feeling would come. It was almost like fear in the way it filled me, rising in my chest. It was almost like tears in how swiftly it came, but it was neither of those. Buoyant where they were heavy, bright where they were dull. I had known contentment before, brief snatches of time in which I pursued solitary pleasure, skipping stones or dicing or dreaming, but in truth, it had been less a presence than an absence. A laying aside of dread. My father was not near, nor boys. I was not hungry or tired or sick. This feeling was different. I found myself grinning until my cheeks hurt, my scalp prickling till I thought it might lift off my head. My tongue ran away from me, giddy with freedom. This and this and this I said to him. I did not have to fear that I spoke too much. I did not have to worry that I was too slender or too slow. This and this and this. I taught him how to skip stones, and he taught me how to carve wood. I could feel every nerve in my body, every brush of air against my skin. He played my mother's lyre, and I watched. When it was my turn to play, my fingers tangled in the strings, and the teacher despaired of me. I did not care. Play again, I told him. And he played until I could barely see his fingers in the dark. I saw then how I had changed. I did not mind anymore that I lost when we raced, and I lost when we swam out to the rocks, and I lost when we tossed spears or skipped stones, because who can, who can be ashamed to lose to such beauty? It was enough to watch him win, to see the soles of his feet flashing as they kicked up sand, or the rise and fall of his shoulders as he pulled through the salt. It was enough. even to speak if I wished. I did not wish. <laughs> I was happy to be silent and watch the men around me. Scops, Peleus took to calling me owl for my big eyes. He was good at this sort of affection, general and unbinding. <laughs> The only place I did not follow was to see his mother. 
he went late at night, or at dawn before the palace was awake, and returned flushed and smelling of the sea. When I asked him about it, he told me freely, his voice strangely toneless. It is always the same. She asks what I'm doing and if I'm well. She'll ask my reputation among men, and then if I'll come with her. Where? The caves under the sea, where the sea nymphs live. So deep the sun did not penetrate. Will you go? No. My father says every mortal who goes never returns the same. When he turned away, I, I made the peasant sign against evil. God's avert. It frightened me a little to hear him speak of such a thing so calmly. Gods and mortals never mix happily in our stories. But she was his mother, I reassured myself, and he was half by himself. In time, his visits with her were just another strangeness, strangeness about him that I became accustomed to, like the marvel of his feet or the inhuman deftness of his fingers. When I heard him climbing back through the windows at dawn, I would mumble from my bed, Is she well? She's well. And he might add, the fish are thick today, or the bay is as warm as a bear, and then we would sleep again. One morning of my second spring, he came back from his visit with his mother later than usual. The sun was almost out of the water, and the goat bells were clanging in the hills. Is she well? She's well. She'd like to meet you. You think I should? I see no harm in it. Tomorrow night, she says. I understood now that it was a command. The gods did not make requests. I knew him well enough to see that he was embarrassed. He was never so stiff with me. Tomorrow? I did not want him to see my fear, though normally we kept nothing from each other. Should I bring a gift? Honey wine? No, she doesn't like that. The next night, when the household slept, I climbed out of our window. The moon was half full, bright enough for me to pick our way over the rocks without a torch. He had said that I was to stand in the surf and she would come. No, he had reassured me, you do not need to speak, she will know. The waves were warm and thick with sand. I shifted, watching small white crabs run through the surf. I was listening, thinking I might hear the splash of her feet as she approached. A breeze blew down the beach, and grateful I closed my eyes to it. When I opened them again, she was there. She was taller than I was. <laughs> taller than any woman I had ever seen. Her black hair was loose down her back, and her skin shone luminous and impossibly pale, as if it dragged light from the moon. She was so close I could smell her, seawater laced with dark brown honey. I did not breathe, I did not dare. You are Patroclus? I flinched at the sound of her voice, hoarse and rasping. I had expected chimes, not the grinding of rocks in the surf. Yes, lady. This taste ran over her face. Her eyes were not like a human's. They were black to the center and flecked with gold. I could not bring myself to meet them. He will be a god. I did not know what to say, so I said nothing. She leaned forward, and I half thought she might touch me, but of course she did not. Do you understand? I could feel her breath on my cheek, not warm at all, but chilled like the depths up of the sea. Do you understand? Yes. She leaned closer still, looming over me. Her mouth was a gash of red, like the torn open stomach of a sacrifice, bloody and oracular. Behind it, her teeth shone sharp and white as bone. Good. You will be dead soon enough. I did not go straight back to the palace. I, I, I could not. I went to the olive grove instead. Sit among the twisting trunks and fallen fruits. It was far from the sea. I did not wish to smell the salt now. You would be dead soon enough. She had said it coldly, as a fact. She did not wish me for his companion, but I was not worth killing. To a goddess, the few decades of human life are barely an inconvenience. And she wished him to be a god. 
she had spoken it so simply as if it were obvious. A, a god, I could not imagine him so. Gods were cold and, and distant, far off as the moon. Nothing like his bright eyes, the warm mischief of his smiles. Her desire was ambitious. It was a difficult thing to make even a half-god immortal. And Thetis was a lesser of lesser gods, a sea nymph only. In our stories, these divinities had to work by wheedling and flattery, by favors won from stronger gods. They could not do much themselves, except live forever. What are you thinking about? It was Achilles come to find me. I had half expected him to come. I, I had wanted him to. Nothing. It was untrue. Yes, it always is. Did she tell you you would die soon? Yes. I'm sorry. She wants you to be a god. No. His face twisted with embarrassment. And in spite of itself, my heart lightened. It was such a boyish response, and so human. Parents everywhere. <laughs> questions still waited to be asked, and I could do nothing until I knew the answer. Do you want to be a... I had promised myself I would not struggle. I sat here in this grove, practicing this very question as I waited for him to find me. Do you want to be a god? I don't know. I don't know how it happens, or when. I don't want to leave here. When would it happen anyway? Soon? Does a place like that even exist? Olympus? She says, she says she knows. She pretends she knows. Achilles. Do you want to be a god? Not yet. The tigers I had not known was there. He's the little. I would not lose him yet. I'd like to be a hero. I think it. If, if the prophecy is true, if there's a war, my mother says I'm even better than Heracles was. I did not know what to say to this. I did not know if it was motherly bias or fact. I did not care. Not yet. Would you want to be a god? <laughs> <laughs> I do not think that is likely. <laughs> I stood and put down a hand for it. Our tunics were dusty and my feet tingled slightly with drying sea salt. There were figs in the kitchen. I saw them. We were only twelve, too young to brood. Bad we need more than you. They said, Oi! Come back here! 